So this is the Courageous Heroes of the Faith Bible Study at Emmanuel for Sunday, July the 26th to study on Jonathan. Let's pray. Lord of all creation, you provided Jonathan and David as a wonderful f example of friendship and love and service. Help us to grow in our thankfulness for the friend of sinners, Jesus Christ, and an appreciation of the courageous example of Jonathan, son of Saul. In Jesus' name, amen. And so we have uh, today is uh, Bible study on Jonathan. A little context uh, for you, first of all, uh, just putting the whole Old Testament in context. Uh, we've got uh, Abraham at about 2,000 years B.C. We have Moses about 1,500 years B.C. And now in our study today, we're at about 1,000 years before Christ in this study of Jonathan and his friend, King David. A little more of the cultural setting. Uh, for what's uh, going on here. Imagine, if you will, having a king for a father. For Jonathan, the son of Israel's first king, no imagining was necessary. His father was Saul, a man God anointed king through the prophet Samuel. The Bible teaches us that Saul was an imposing figure and that the Bible says, from his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. As Saul's eldest son, Jonathan should have rightly succeeded his father as king. But you and I know that human customs and God's plans are not always the same. After the death of Saul, God placed David on Israel's throne. In fact, Jonathan dies a tragic death at the hand of the Philistines, along with his father and his two brothers, Abinadab and Malkishua. Nestled among the pages of the Bible between the 13th and the 31st chapter of 1 Samuel, Jonathan lives out his life as an example of a courageous hero before the Lord. Jonathan had courage in war as well as in peace. And so I'm going to make an introduction for you today of our study today. You're going to meet this hero, Jonathan, and you're going to do it as I speak in the first person as Jonathan. So here goes. My name is Jonathan. Perhaps you've heard of me. Most people know that during my lifetime, I was the best friend of the man who became Israel's greatest king, David. But I must tell you about an often overlooked incident. During my lifetime, Israel was oppressed by the Philistines, a people who lived in the Holy Land. Intensely religious, the Philistines worshipped Dagon, the detestable grain deity who was depicted with the hands and face of a man and the tail of a fish. They also worshipped Ashtoreth, their goddess of sensual love and fertility, who enticed many with temple prostitutes. This odious people, the Philistines, lured many Israelites into idol worship. For this reason, the Lord promised that my father would drive them from the land that he promised my great ancestor Abraham back in 1 Samuel 9. The Philistines took great pleasure in keeping us under their thumb. During their reign, they took away our blacksmiths, preventing us from making any implements of war. My father's army was consisted of a ragtag unit carrying only plowshares, axes, and sickles. These farm tools the Philistines allowed us to keep, but then charged exorbitant prices when we needed them honed for use in our fields. Only my father and I carried swords or spears. 
in 1 Samuel 13. One day, a detachment of Philistines came to the pass at Michmash. I decided to leave my father and his 600 men army behind. Only my armor bearer came with me. I said, come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. My armor bearer replied, do all that is in your heart, do as you wish. Behold, I am with you, heart and soul. We asked the Lord for a sign. If the Philistines said, come up to us, we knew that God had given them into our hands. And that is precisely what happened. Between my armor bearer and me, 20 Philistines died that day. Soon after, God sent an earthquake, causing a panic among the remaining Philistines camping nearby. Do I want to be remembered as David's best friend, you might ask? Well, yes. Am I angered that I never had the opportunity to reign over God's chosen people? No. My love for the Lord of all creation sweeps me along. I believe that God will one day bring forth a deliverer to save his people, as the prophets have said. Whether this deliverer comes through my lineage or not, or whether I am to receive power, prestige, and fame does not matter. Regardless of what transpires in my life, I know God provides all the courage I need to stand between a vengeful father and David, the man who anointed him to succeed me. And so, what we have going on here is uh, a display of a man who was alone but, uh, but found the strength given to him by God uh, to do what was right. And so given the circumstances surrounding Jonathan and David, one could understand if animosity erupted between the two. For instance, God anointed Saul king over the Israelites. By rule of succession, Saul's kingdom should have passed to Jonathan. Yet twice Saul disobeyed the Lord, once in 1 Samuel 13 and then again in 1 Samuel 15. Saul's disobedience prompted God to utter words similar to those he spoke to Noah. And I believe are appropriate. When God grieved, it said he removed his spirit from Saul. He bypassed Jonathan and anointed David king. Though he was a young shepherd who was not Jonathan's equal, but by human standards, instead of lashing out at David and shouting aloud, I won't get mad, I'll just get even, as some might do, Jonathan reached out a hand of companionship before his love for David transcended life itself. You see, God has a plan. His will will be done. We can almost hear Jonathan say those words with his own lips. Now Jonathan stands between his father and David, between God's present king and his future king. Only with God-given courage could Jonathan stand firm straddling two important relationships like he was called to do. As David's fame grew, so did Saul's jealousy. Let me read for you from 1 Samuel 18. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. And so Saul removed him from his presence and made him a commander of a thousand. And he went out and came in before the people. And David had success in all of his undertakings, for the Lord was with him. And when Saul saw that he had great success, he stood in fearful awe of him. 
And so what effect might Jonathan's friendship with David have on the relationship between a father and a son? Well, Jonathan's relationship with David strained Jonathan's relationship with his father. As you study this lesson, note how Jonathan continues to love Saul and put the best construction on all that Saul does. Even after Saul attempts to kill David, Jonathan continues to love and honor his father as God desires, as he says so in the Ten Commandments. David was victorious over Goliath and in numerous battles against the Philistines. He won confrontations that Saul thought would have resulted in David's death. In spite of David's fame, Jonathan loved David as his own soul. In ancient times, individuals swore allegiance to one another through ceremonies called covenants. In 1 Samuel 18, we learn of such a pact between Jonathan and David. What gifts did Jonathan give David in his pledge of loyalty? Well, let's read, starting at verse 3. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. As a pledge of his faithfulness, Jonathan gives David the robe he was wearing, along with his tunic, sword, bow, and belt. Now what might such gifts symbolize? Well, scholars believe that Jonathan was an archer well known for his skill with a bow. Each of these gifts shows that Jonathan regarded David as his equal, even though Jonathan was the son of a king. Additional covenants between Jonathan and David occur in 1 Samuel 20, starting at verse 12, and then 1 Samuel 23, starting at verse 16. And it's their last time together. We'll take a look at each of these covenant, and we'll then we'll talk about any change that comes in Jonathan's faithfulness through the years. First of all, starting at verse 12 from 1 Samuel 20. And Jonathan said to David, The Lord, the God of Israel, be witness. When I have sounded out my father about this time tomorrow, or on the third day, behold, if he is well disposed toward David, shall I not then send and disclose it to you? But should it please my father to do you harm, the Lord do so to Jonathan, and more also, if I do not disclose it to you and send you away, that you may go in safety. May the Lord be with you, as he has been with my father. If I am still alive, show me the steadfast love of the Lord, that I may not die. Do not cut off your steadfast love from my house forever, when the Lord cuts off even one of my enemies of David from the face of the earth. And Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord take vengeance on David's enemies. Now, in 1 Samuel 20, that we've just read, we learn that Jonathan asked the Lord to strike against David's enemies. This covenant might remind students of the Lord's Prayer when we petition God with the words, Thy will be done. Well, that's exactly what Jonathan did. Starting in verse 16. And Jonathan, Saul's son, rose and went to David at Horesh, and strengthened his hand in God. And he said to him, Do not fear, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. Saul my father also knows this. And the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. David remained at Horesh, and Jonathan went home. And so here, in chapter 23, 
we read that Jonathan knew that David was God's choice as Israel's next king. So too does Saul. And that we find no animosity or regret in Jonathan's words as Jonathan and David pledge mutual friendship. In fact, there are no changes in Jonathan's faithfulness. Instead, we see his love and respect for David growing in the face of adversity. Again, from verse 30. Again, unlike Jonathan, whose love for David grew throughout the years, Saul became resentful and openly hostile to David. How does Saul react in the following verses? First from 1 Samuel 18, Saul throws a spear at David and attempts to pin David to the wall. In Samuel 19, again, Saul throws a spear at David in an attempt to kill him. And in 1 Samuel 20, in anger, Saul throws his spear at Jonathan. Not only was Jonathan faithful to David, but he was also faithful to his father Saul, even in the face of Saul's hatred for David. After reading 1 Samuel 19, explain how Jonathan showed faithfulness to his father. Verse 19, And Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants, that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. And Jonathan told David, Saul, my father, seeks to kill you. Therefore be on your guard in the morning. Stay in a secret place and hide yourself. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are, and I will speak to my father about you. And if I learn anything, I will tell you. And Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul his father and said to him, Let not the king sin against his servant David, because he has not sinned against you, and because his deeds have brought good to you. For he took his life in his hand, and he struck down the Philistines. And the Lord worked a great salvation for all Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood by killing David without cause? And Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan. Saul swore, As the Lord lives, he shall not be put to death. And Jonathan called David, and Jonathan reported to him all these things. And Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as before. And so, Jonathan speaks in defense of David and calms Saul's temper. In so doing, Jonathan prevents Saul from committing the sin of murder as expressed in God's law of the Ten Commandments. Now you may recall that David often had opportunity to kill Saul, but he chose not to do so. Why does David's at what does act David's action teach us about his friendship with Jonathan? Out of respect for Jonathan, and in keeping with Moses' law forbidding murder, David does not kill Saul, although several opportunities to do so present themselves. Saul, Jonathan, and two of his brothers in the end finally die fighting the Philistines. Happens in 1 Samuel chapter 31. Now the Philistines were fighting against Israel and the men of Israel fled before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Gilboa. And the Philistines overtook Saul and his sons and the Philistines struck down Jonathan and Abedinadab and Malchishua, the sons of Saul. In his death, Jonathan left behind a five-year-old son. How does David honor his best friend, Jonathan? Well, David cared for Jonathan's son, providing him a place at his table in Jerusalem and giving him land 
that once belonged to King Saul. David's actions were in keeping with his covenant to Jonathan. Take a moment to read David's beautiful eulogy of Jonathan and Saul, a eulogy often called the Song of the Bow. It's found in 2 Samuel chapter 1, starting in verse 17. How does, here's our question, how does David's friendship with Jonathan temper his attitude towards Saul? And David lamented with this lamentation over Saul and Jonathan his son. And he said, it should be taught to the people of Judah. Behold, it is written in the book of Jashar. He said, your glory, O Israel, is plain in your high places. How the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Goth. Publish it not in the streets of Ashkelon, lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised exult. You mountains of Gilbo, let there be no dew or rain upon you, no fields of offerings, for there the shield of the mighty was defiled, the shield of Saul, not anointed with oil. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan turned not back, and the sword of Saul returned not empty. Saul and Jonathan, beloved and lovely, in life and in death they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles, they were stronger than lions. You daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you luxuriously in scarlet, who put ornaments of gold on your apparel. How the mighty have fallen, in the midst of battle. And so how can these words uh, about Jonathan and David and their faithfulness to each other, what can they teach us today? When well, his letter to the Galatians, St. Paul details the fruit of the Spirit. In chapter 5, verses 22 to 23, can we conclude that Jonathan was filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, enabling this friendship with David. Well, listen to what St. Paul writes. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Can we conclude that Jonathan was filled with the power of the Holy Spirit? I believe, yes, we may conclude just that, that Jonathan was filled with the Holy Spirit, for he demonstrated the fruits of the Spirit described by St. Paul. Jonathan showed love, patience, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. Jonathan's self-denying love for David is sometimes cited as a precursor to the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus Christ for us. How might such a comparison be rightfully considered in light of Philippians chapter 2 we read a moment ago? Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jonathan demonstrated selfless love for David. Although the law of succession meant that Jonathan should rule after his father, Jonathan graciously stepped aside and acquiesced to God's will. Jonathan was willing to give up his own crown so that God's will might be done. What a wonderful example of Christ-like behavior. May we do likewise. 
In closing, let's read together uh, the, the, uh, two of the hymn verses of a very popular hymn that is very fitting today. After we've taken a look at the friendship of Jonathan and David, let's read together two verses from What a Friend We Have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Are you weak and heavy laden? Cumbered with a load of care, precious Savior, still our refuge, take it to the Lord in prayer. Do your friends despise, forsake you, take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield you, you will find a solace there. Well, that concludes our study on Jonathan and David today. I pray you found it helpful and beneficial as we take a look at the friendships that God gives us in our lives and what selfless, Christ-like action looks like there. Emmanuel has returned to on-site worship on Saturdays at 6, Sunday at 8 and 10.45 in the morning, and then again Monday evening at 6 p.m. We're also having family Bible study at 9.30 a.m. in the school cafeteria. And when the time is right, you are welcome to join us in worship and in Bible study on site at Emmanuel. And so when the, worst, when the time is right, we'll see you in church.